Hello, everybody. Uh, it's uh, welcome to the Frank and Stan chat. And uh, as you can see, it is Frank and Stan this week. <laughs> Hello, Stan. Uh, morning, Frank. Yeah. Uh, morning to everybody. Um, yeah. Pleasant morning, actually. I know. It's uh, we're we're into sort of mid February now, and uh, the light just you know, the sun is certainly a little bit brighter in the sky and it's uh, now that we've had this sort of heavy snow spell I hope that's the last of it for the, the severe winter weather and uh, this morning does feel slightly uh, spring-like so spring, yeah yeah um, anyway I we're a few days late uh, broadcasting this week because I've been a little bit under the weather um, I, I'm, I'm about 95% back and uh, I'm going to take it a, you know pretty easy for the next uh, week or so um, but anyway, um, we are, uh, I, was, I was thinking, Stan, we don't say, you know, all the rules now about no. you know, being kind. Care. It's not as if they're out of the window, uh, our little rules of engagement about the things we say. But uh, I hope that people get a sense that we're not out to slag anybody off or whatever. And we appreciate these uh, really difficult times. And the government's got some difficult decisions to announce tomorrow. Um, and uh, I think both, both of us, you know, um, wish them well in those decision making yeah uh, not to be bullied into into decision making is yeah. the, uh, is the yeah. issue for me so what's caught your eye this week stan well i suppose on that on that very thing uh, i was reading which fits with a constant theme with us about words that um that chris whitty is it as as not necessarily agreeing with with some of the things that the prime minister wants to announce uh, and I read that the uh, the team behind them are trying to write a set of words that he can agree to say. Right. So that, that fits in nicely to weasel words, doesn't it? If you say this, everyone will think you are backing it, even though you've said, I can't back this big bang approach, if that's what they do with all schools opening on the same day at the same time. Yeah, I mean, this... this... This is for the 8th of March, isn't it, that they're looking yeah. for. Um, it really is around how you manage risk. <clears throat> and um, uh, I would have thought that um, one of the major factors that you could build into this um, so that we don't have to then sort of try and prevent having to lock down again is to do things in a staged approach so you can have a little bit of time just to consider you know, what the impact of, say, opening primary schools has been. Um, before we then engage in sort of getting every secondary school and post-16 student back. Um, you know, I, I would have thought that's a fairly sort of uh, um, important consideration to make sure you get this first stage right. Yeah, there was a report, and I haven't read it, so I, I can't quote from it, saying that the highest prevalence at the moment was in primary age and lower secondary age children. Mm -hmm. um, now, I, I don't know where that's come from, I think it was in The Guardian, I, I, I saw it, but it does mean that either that's not being taken into consideration if opening primary schools is an absolute certainty, or it's it's another piece of information that's probably not what the headline says. You know, it, it might be, it depends who you test, I suppose. Yes, so yes. I don't think primary children have been tested no. in the same way. No. Um, but there is the again. I read something. I don't. The problem is you don't know what what the truth behind it is. That we're going to look at, at testing of primary schools at home twice a week bilateral. I just uh, well, I, you know, handling handling a twelve thirteen year old at home has been difficult enough. I would imagine for most families. Telling them you've got to stick a, a great big thing up a nose and and down the throat twice a week mm. I just well I think the difficulty that Witty and others have a, a sort of difficulty I'm trying to relate this to issues that you face in a school setting or whatever that you know in um you you have you have to offer the best advice you can and uh, there comes a point there are two things you can do you offer the best advice you can and you work with the person who's then making that decision or you get to a point where actually that person appears to be ignoring all of the advice yeah. or actually you don't feel as though you want to be associated with the outcomes of that 
And I would have thought that, you know, for people trying to work their way through this pandemic, it's a really, really difficult position to be to be put yeah. in. Um, and so in a way, um, it's it's a bit like uh, the uh, the health advisor to Donald Trump, you know, sticking with it when, you know, he was a, suggesting that it would be OK to put bleach down, you know, mm -hmm. to swallow bleach, um, try and kill the virus. You know, actually, you know, that that gentleman stayed at it, you know, because I think he saw that there was an importance to be within the camp rather than yes. outside of it. Yeah. But I, I also think, though, if if we are, it's not about democracy, it's about honesty in office. And we should be able to say, look, this is a decision we've made based on the risks we've seen. And let's say the decision is we're going to open all schools. Now, you know, Chris Whitty should be able to say, well, my advice has not been that. My advice is to, and we should be able to to, to do that in, in a modern society where we can appreciate that there's a difference between the scientific advice and the political decision, which is based on other risks. Yeah. And, and we should be able to do that as an, as an adult society, not, not have somebody's words change so it sounds as though they're in support. I think, I think one of the problems throughout the pandemic, one of the difficulties schools have had, is the lack of clarity about what are the triggers you know, so in, and I think that um, at the moment in some uh, northwest, uh, uh, certainly in Greater Manchester boroughs, um, infection rates appear to be rising. Mm. And so um, in the vast majority of them, they're not. Um, but actually it'd be quite helpful to know within Greater Manchester, you know, what, what are we all aiming for? You know, mm. what, where is that sort of goal? You know, what is the goal? You know, because actually it's a number of factors, but there's a lack of clarity about those factors in terms of yeah so i have a real fear that the people will will simply who have been locked up for a, and feel constrained for such a long time will actually you know just become worn down by the the lack of clarity that oh you know, what the heck i mean I, i've no idea where this is going you know yeah. um, everybody you know people have had their jabs well let's just get out there you know i mean yeah. well i think frank I, i've witnessed that more in this last week with certain things that have happened I couple of, of deaths that are fairly mm. close and the frustration of people when they realize what they can and can't do and then you know travel th things that you think I can sort out that should be quite easy and suddenly you can't mm. and it's I can feel that frustration when I talk to people now that that actually they want either they want something very positive something that we can we can celebrate properly um, but they also want an end point. A, a, they want a date, and I'm against setting a date. I think it, it's uh, the one thing I've agreed with the Prime Minister in a long time is that it should be about data, not dates. Yeah. But I do think people want an idea of wh where's, the, where's the end game? When are we playing in the end game? Mm. Because at the moment, I, you know, go back to Churchill and, you know, it's not this isn't the beginning of the end, but it may be the end of the beginning. It, that kind of, of uh, expression, I think, would help. But instead, well, one, we've always been offered the more positive, it'll all be over by yes. summer, uh, autumn, winter, Easter, next summer, next Christmas. Um, and and that all that does is, is raise hope that then gets dashed yeah, rather yeah. than saying, right, th this is what we're aiming to do, and we're aiming for um, an R rate of 0.6, let's say, in an area, and when we reach that, then we'll talk about what opens and when it opens. And, and, and like the, my view of the, of the, uh, the sort of um, restaurants, bars, etc., is they're not the problem. It's how people get there mm. and back. Yeah. Because, you know, Manchester, if you go into Manchester to a bar and the bars are all socially distanced, they're doing everything they can, and then what happens? How do you get there? Yeah. The crowd on a bus or a train? What do we do when we come out of the bars when they shut? We, we mingle with people in the, in the street. So it's not the, the bars per se, yeah. but it's, it's the extra bits that, that cause the difficulty. Yeah, I agree. Um, well, what's caught my eye this week uh, is just really uh, having been so low um, and unwell, um, just the fact how close, you know, how important it is to have family, 
yeah, with you. I mean, I, 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 we, we know uh, a few friends who live on their own. And the thought of me working my way through what I've had the last week on my own, I would have been in a pretty dark place, I think. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of grateful for family and I'm grateful for, you know, a, a, a partner who's, who's, who's sort of put me first and her second in the last week. Um, OK, uh, let's. Uh, oh, can I just mention about this album behind me before I move on? Because people have started asking, why have you got that album there? So what I've decided to do is uh, last week I heard uh, on Radio 4 that, that it was 50 years since the Tapestry album was released by Carol King and Radio 4, uh, the, the morning um, news programme, uh, did a piece about it with Katie Tunstall reviewing it. And actually what happened was it made me listen again to the album. So I've decided now to go back to this sort of rolling programme of 50 years. So that's that was released in the UK 50 years this week so I don't know what next week's will be and whether I've got that album but if I have it will be up there um right one thing I've been thinking about Stan is about um okay regardless of how uh the government announced tomorrow whether school's going back full on or in a, in a sort of phased way it, the balance between reintegration uh in terms of care sort of emotional needs physical well-being and academic well-being you know now I, I i'm aware that all of those you know in a really brilliant ex, you know education experience need to be wrapped up together you know i'm not suggesting one trumps another one but actually during there are times like in the last week when i've needed a lot of care you know um and i just wondered what your thoughts are in terms of the speed of reintegration in terms of getting into back to what appears to be or feels like a sort of like a normal learning yeah. experience. Well, my, my first thoughts are that, that I, I, I really don't, in primary, I really don't like the, the catch-up phrase because my, my thoughts are that the first thing that we need to do when everybody's back is to heal. Mm. Uh, and so that will, for me, that in, involves socialisation, it involves play, it involves fun, it's about remaking relationships, uh, re-establishing routines. And I personally, I think that's going to take some time. And, and for me, that will take priority on catch up, as they call it, or, or drilling. I, I do think there's a view that, that children's heads are like hollow tin cans that we, we have to fill up with, with, with knowledge. Um, so for me, I think I, I would, if I was still running a school, I would be dividing far more time to healing, getting people back together, getting children back to routines uh, before I started to push where, where we are on academic, where we are on achievement, where we are on progress. In fact, I'd, I'd probably be looking at between now and Easter, the, the, the main thrust would be let's learn to get on with each other again. Yeah. Because and, and take the opportunity to change things that haven't been quite as good previously. We, we we've almost got a fresh start. It's a yeah. it's a chance to relook at the the culture in the school and what we're about. I think also teachers. Um, I think their focus primarily when everybody in a normal situation is around academic assessment. You know, and 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 and, and I think some of the stuff they do. Um, well, let, let me just say me, my focus was always more on the academic. And actually, it was only when um, something became apparent that I started to consider what some of those other factors could be that were affecting academic progress, you know. Um, whereas now I think actually there needs to be a much more sort of targeted approach around, you know, emotional support, yeah. you, know, have, you know, trying to ensure those conversations um, with families, with carers, parents about, you know, uh, those experiences, trying to make those and, and to feed that information, to open that dialogue up when, after a week or so, so that parents who have actually been doing this job feel as though they are successfully handing over the learning rather than it being dumped, yeah. you know, they're key, they're, think, things have changed for them, haven't they? And yeah, we need to I, be in a different place for them. I do think in, in the schools, certainly the schools that I speak to, there is a new relationship with parents as a result of this. 
Um, I was talking to a teacher the day who, who was having to ring a parent to say, please, can you get your child to log off? Because for some <laughs> reason, it has taken over, he's taken over the, uh, yeah. I can't remember what it's called, where you are in control of everything. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this one child. And, and so there's been phone calls to parents to check. Uh, and, and lovely ones, uh, one had told me where the child had fallen asleep. And they rang the mother to say, uh, by the way, your child is attending lessons, but is asleep on the set. <laughs> but that, I think those relationships will be strengthened by that, particularly about, about the teaching and learning. And, and I mean, I don't want to misinterpret what I'm saying about, you know, there will be learning going on. It just yeah. won't be the number one priority no. because you, you learn those routines again by, having maths lessons, having English lessons, etc. I, I just, I don't want people to think when they go back to school that we're, we're cramming children again for some reason that's artificial. Yeah, I, I think... Some testing that will go on later. I think Andy, Andy, uh, no, it was Mike Rotherham, wasn't it? Um, who, yeah. I guess, uh, a week or so back, you know, was making the point that children, you know, have learned other, may well have learned other things. And of course, that that experience is going to be unique to each child in your class whereas before the journey was slightly you had more oversight of that journey you know as a class teacher so it really is important to get a sense of the breadth and depth of that learning um because you know some children's experiences may have been extremely positive and they're not where you think they are you yeah. know because they shouldn't be viewed in the same way as every other child in the in the class you know and there are others that are going to have had awful experiences um, and will need a lot of love and care and support just for the human being within them you know forget you know that they're, they're not able to do their tables in quite the same way they're able to do them before you know which oh, I mean so what you know but actually I, I do, I do think that. most most children are resilient uh, and and I do think they will I would have said bounce back until we had one of our guests who said spring forwards. Yes. More positive. And I do think most will. I, I don't want to to uh, underrate the, the issues of, of some children, and that, that's clear. We're going to have to put some additional support in, I think, to schools. But l let's not let the, the picture be that all primary school children are going I... to be have mental health problems, mm. because they won't, but some will. And we need to be able to identify those quickly and provide the support that they need yeah yeah and i think that getting the right i mean um support around uh, cams and whatever was a struggle before the beginning of the pandemic yeah. i think schools need to look really carefully at the quality of the support that they're providing um mm -hmm. because the challenges for some now um they may have been able to uh, control and and manage those situations but there may well be children, I'm not saying a huge number, but there may be children out there for whom the, the level or quality of the support that previously was offered is no longer viable. It's no longer sufficiently strong to, to support them going forward. Yeah, I, I just, I get when you read the press and when you, when you see people, people talking who I suspect have different motives for getting children back to school. Mm. And, and they talk about this widespread mental health issue. Um, I just think you're using that for a different purpose and yeah. you're not somebody who's been in schools and seen how children recover quickly, most children. Yeah. And I, I do think that'll be something that we need, maybe to put some training in, for some additional training for teachers and, and support staff to be able to spot those children who perhaps need no, and you're right, it is emotional, it is, you know, same before we had a death recently, a neighbour, and I had to stop my wife going and seeing um, the, the husband of the, the person who's died, because I knew what she would do is run up and give him a hug, and I said, you, you can't do that, yeah, yeah. you risk it, and it's horrible, so we, we spoke to, to him through his window, wow. how, how awful is that, mm. but, so, you know, there'll, there'll be children who've, who've gone through processes similar to that with with um, certainly more likely grandparents than parents but who've, who've had loss and not had that opportunity to share 
that feeling with everybody else. And those those deep feelings need to be brought out. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, one other thing that I was doing this week, um, I did a, I put together a, a couple of videos with Joe Dundas from the Co-op Academies Trust um, Communications Manager is. And, uh, and basically we just chatted about the journey that we had um, in terms of developing a sort of like uh, an ethos, a culture within the trust as to what it stands for and or what it stood for and and, uh, and how we conveyed that to staff and to parents. And it was a really, it was, it was heartwarming really to sort of just talk through with um, Joe and um, how we've been able to develop sort of a link, the links with the co-ops marketing brand press team, social media team particularly to sort of get that message across and uh, yeah it, it sort of made me think about the importance of messaging and the importance of those words again so schools really need to think carefully take the time now before the 8th of March as to how they're going to signal you know, a positive return you know and, and actually parents wanting perhaps a slightly more frequent during the early days early weeks yeah. up to perhaps Easter and slightly a slightly more regular um, communication. It may be a broad communication, but one of positivity and one of looking forward. Yeah, I, I think Frank. I think we we breached, we touched on this the other week. It, you know, now is the time. The last thing on your mind probably is mm -hmm. long term planning for the school, the school development plan, school improvement plan. But as a from a leader's point of view, there's a lot to be said for for formulating some things that you share with your staff so we are you know to show them we are planning in the long term yeah, yeah. We're, we're still we're getting beyond the day-to-day -day crisis and we're now starting to look longer term we think there's an end point yes because i think that sends some positivity within the staff i agree and and, and particularly there'll be a, a small number but i suspect there will be a period now of um, a number of senior leaders deciding to retire yeah. um, because they've stayed with it probably longer to see the school or the trust through the pandemic and, and those individuals need to really think carefully about your know, messaging timing everything like that you know um, so uh, all of that needs to be sort of agreed in advance with your governors with your trust board you know from personal experience yeah the messaging of that's really important on, a, on our website uh yesterday i put a message to to some of our schools or all our schools or anybody else that goes on on the website written by a head teacher who who is is kind of saying now's the time to to use your advisor for what you want them to do so so almost don't have somebody coming in telling you x y and z get them coming in but say this is what we need help and support with yeah and use the support mechanisms that are there to your advantage and for your needs not at the moment responding to what everyone else is telling you to do yeah because when we get back you know schools have ch we have all changed yeah yeah you know, and we need to, i think schools need to really even the most successful that know where they're going you know there is a time for just making sure that that direction is the right yep. direction now. Um, right. Well, that's 25 minutes or so, Stan. Um, I hope people have enjoyed uh, watching and listening to us. Um, next week, um, we have uh, Angela Holdsworth, who's a, uh, a CEO of um, a trust in the Northwest. And uh, I think it's one of these newly appointed um, hub teaching um, centres or whatever. So uh, be interested to see what Angela's got to say um, and uh, she'll be joining us next week. Um, so from Stan and I, uh, yeah. oh, i tell you what we haven't done. Word, Word of the week. week. Word of the week. <gasps> Gosh, got nearly, nearly. <laughs> I, I, go on then, Stan. You go with your Word of the Week. I need to read this because it's a long word. It's, oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it's English word, though. Oh, good. It's um, a circumlocular. No, it's not. It's... <laughs> 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 a circum lock you no i can't do it i'll do it next time i'll go for another one which is ipsy dixitism 
Okay, what's that? That means to insist that something's true because somebody else has told you it's true. Oh, wow, well, gosh. We've had a lot of that over the and last I've year. I've seen some, some stuff that a relative sent to me, very worried that they'd received it from one of their relatives about vaccination. It's the usual. Oh, thing right. And it was that that my relative was certain it was true because a distant relative of hers had told her it was true. And you have to say, well, it might not be. <laughs> well, well, my word um, comes from, I've been um, listening to a podcast called Something Rhyming With Thursday, uh, no, Purple. And um, it's got uh, Giles Brandreth and uh, Judy Dent, the, the woman who is the Lexa. Uh, uh, sorry? Susie Dent. Susie Dent, sorry. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, on um, Countdown. And the, uh, I was listening to it. I don't think it was a recent um, broadcast, but it, it was a little word called grotty. The origins of the word grotty. Um, and the first time that was used was in the film Hard Day's Night in 1964, in the Beatles film. And of course, it's a shortening of the word grotesque. Um, but it was lovely to think that, you know, uh, the Beatles who actually created so much original stuff actually were the, the, the origins of a word that was, you know, probably some people will call, you know, um, you know in, various, in various ways have used that word over the last year to describe a number of actions and decisions that have been made and probably where they've been as well uh, and how they've felt. Okay, well, that is the end of this broadcast. So uh, we'll see you all uh, next week, uh, all being well. And uh, we'll certainly know a little bit more about what, uh, well, perhaps we should look up the meaning of the origins of the word roadmap, which seems to be the uh, in word at the moment. So we'll know more next week. So we'll see you all then.